All right, so look, you can put up there uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and you can start with verse 6. Actually, let me go ahead and we can maybe, let's just go ahead and go backwards a little bit. Uh, we'll go 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we'll actually go to verse 1. Just to, It might help us get a little bit of, uh, of, of context, uh, because in verse 1 and verse 2, it says this. It says, dare any of you... Having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. Well, first off, what he's trying to say is this, is that people in the church in Corinth were actually taking the problems that they had with one another to an outside legal court source instead of bringing their situations to the people of God and, and allowing the saints to judge the situation. All right. And I'm going to be clear on this. I'm not trying to say that there's never a time or a place uh, that, that, you, that there has to be legal matters that you have to hire an attorney. But what I'm trying to tell you is this right here. The, the Apostle Paul is making it very clear that we should be able to settle if we're truly men and women of God the situations amongst ourselves. And that and that if it's a matter within house, if it's a matter with between believers, it should be able to be brought to the saints of God. And that people would be able to make a decision based on the word of God, based on the wisdom of God's word and based upon the Holy Spirit is what he's saying. He says, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Then he goes on to say this, which is very profound. And we definitely don't have time to uncover this tonight. But know you not that we will judge angels how much more things that pertain to this life. So if we take that context and then we go back to verse 6, it seems like this is really heavy on the Apostle Paul's mind and his heart. He says, but brother goes to law with brother and that before unbelievers. He's saying that believers are taking one another to court and that it's actually being done on the outside where the people in the community know what's going on. And it's given a very bad taste. It's not really painting Jesus in a light that's conducive for other people to want to serve the Lord or to really come, uh, come to Christ. Amen. He says, now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you because you go uh, with one another. All right. And so I'm going to go back to my notes now. So and, and, and I have quite a bit of this scripture, but he says there in verse seven. Now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you because you go to law with one another. Why do you not rather take wrong? We could put the definite article in there. Why do you not rather take the wrong? Because really, that's the heart of Jesus, my friend. Yeah. Jesus took the wrong. Jesus took and people despitefully used him. And you know the story, if you've read it before, that they, they blindfolded him. When I think of what they did to him before they hung him on that cross, I'm telling you, it really gets to me. They blindfolded him. They slapped him. They put the crown of thorns on him. They hit him in the head with rods. And they plucked the beard, the hair out of his beard. And they said, prophesy, son of man, who it is that strikes you. And then the last word that he speaks, I believe, is this. Father, one of the last words, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then he and then he says it is finished and he breathes out his last breath. And I'm here to tell you right now that most of the time whenever Christians are being offended by other believers and things are coming against us, we're not really living our lives that way. And instead, we're wanting justice. And I'm, my, my question is, do we really believe that God can be our defender? I don't want to get into this too much, but I remember talking to a young lady way back when we had that restaurant. My family tried to have a restaurant. That was a bad mistake on our part, but that was actually a fleshly move. I can be transparent with you and tell you that a lot of times Christians make fleshly moves. And it's not that the Lord will waste it. You'll learn, but you learn in the hard way. Make sure you get the heart of the Lord before you move in those certain directions. But I can remember sitting in the car with a young lady that was working for us. And we were sitting there talking about the Lord. And she was kind of like a family member kind of sort of and and we were sitting there talking about the lord and she was sharing with me the concerns that she was having with other human beings people she felt like people were coming against her she felt like she was being taken advantage of and about every fifth word she'd say but i know the lord's my defender and then she'd say but i know the lord's my defender and then all of a sudden out of nowhere i just couldn't help myself i said well then why won't you let him defend you sis 
Because you're over here trying really hard to, 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 you're not letting him defend you. And instead, you're really defending yourself. And I think that that's part of what it is, is that, you know, sometimes we feel like whenever we're hurt that, and we feel defensiveness, that we feel like we have to defend ourselves. And I just want to encourage you to let you know that if you'll learn how to put that in the hands of God, he'll take care of that for you and he will, he will heal it and he will mend it. Amen. That's not really uh, the, 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 the thrust of my message, but that is a heart. That is the heart of Jesus. He says, <clears throat> why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Which means that you, you know, like you're allowing or whenever someone defrauds you, it's like through deceit, they commit fraud on you. They might be lying on you. They, they might have had an ulterior motive on you. You didn't really know what was going on, but they basically, they did you wrong. And he's saying, why won't you allow that to happen? And he says in that, you're, they, you do wrong and defraud. Instead of you allowing yourself to be done wrong to, you turn around and you do wrong to someone else. So in other words, if somebody's talking bad about you, instead of just taking it and bringing it to the Lord, you turn around and you talk bad about them. And that's just one little example of how something like that could happen. And you're doing it to your brothers, he said. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I've actually, I've actually covered this passage of scripture several times over, like, I feel like I've actually talked about it a few times in the last <clears throat> couple of months. I just want to say something. When we start to get into some of the sin stuff that is going to talk about, I want you to know that I realize I've already preached that part and it's going to talk about fornicators and all that. I want you to know that I'm not necessarily trying to point that out tonight, but I will point out if you're in life of fornication, you do need to get along with the Lord about that. And you really, you need to let him deal with your heart. Amen. Uh, but what I'm trying to talk about more than anything is the fact that there's the fact that the, about the, the, the spirit of God living on the inside of you and trying to talk to you about a life uh, that that's going to bring glory to God is really what I'm trying to bring out. Amen. It, it, but, but I do want to say this. He says, don't you know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? So I think there's I'm also on this thing lately where the Holy Spirit's really driving me to say, no, son, you need to pay attention to every word in my word. And by the grace of the Holy Spirit that is given to you because of what Jesus did for you at the cross, you need to pay attention to it. And you need to believe me that I can give you the grace and the strength that you need in order to obey it. Not just the stuff that you want because you're excited about it. Whatever that might be, but the whole of God's word, amen, like in other words, if he's a healer, he's a healer. I want to believe him for healing. If he's a deliverer then, and he'll deliver people from demonic spirits, I want to believe him for, for to, to heal people from demonic spirits. Amen. But if he's telling me, uh, hallelujah, not to defraud my brother, and if he's telling me not to treat people improperly, and, 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 if, and right here, if he's telling me, don't you know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? I can't get that out of my heart. And I know I said something like this a little while ago, and we're gonna a, a couple of weeks ago, and then we're gonna just we're gonna skate on through. But I cannot get out of my mind and out of my heart the, the fact that because when he says the unrighteous, but he's calling them brothers. He's not trying to say that they're unrighteous, but he's trying to say you're acting like unrighteous people. That, that's what he's saying. And I can prove it to you because it's later on in the scripture. He said, Don't you know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And, 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 and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But he's, he's also calling them brethren against brethren. You're not, we're not supposed to treat one another that way. And when the love of God is on the inside of our heart and in our lives, we're supposed to, because the spirit of God lives in us, we're supposed to know right from wrong. And we're supposed to try, we're, by the grace of God, not just try, but by the grace of God, be empowered to do what, what God is calling us to do. And so then he goes on to say this. He says, be not deceived. I, and I, can't, I keep going back to this, but it's like, okay, if you're saved and you're born again and the Holy Spirit lives in your heart, because I don't know, I'd venture to say in a crowd, this is not a large crowd, but I would venture to say that with the crowd of people we have, if I, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, please don't raise your hand. But I would imagine that if I asked you to raise your hand and, we, and you felt like you could, that there would be maybe a couple of people that would say that they committed fornication after they became a Christian. 
Okay, I would imagine now that's not normal behavior according to the word of God, but but people do fall short of the glory of God. But we have to be careful that we don't think that that's okay. And especially then once we get into an understanding of the message of the cross and we begin to when I or the new covenant, whatever you want to call it, the finished work of the Christ. When we start to really understand what Jesus has done and how what he did at the cross, when it says you made a way, amen, <clears throat> you tore the veil, it gives us access to the presence of God and the spirit of God moving and strengthening us and empowering us to do the will of God and to obey the word of God. But what I'm trying to say is this, is that if we understand what it means to be justified by faith and that it's Jesus's righteousness given to us as a gift. Does that give us the liberty, you see what I'm saying, to not definitely, the people would say, well, I'm definitely not to commit fornication, Pastor Matt, give me a break. Okay, but does it give us the liberty to defraud our brother? Does it give us the liberty to, because someone treats us improperly, that we turn around and treat them improperly? And I think you know the answer to that, right? And so he goes on through all of that. Neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, the effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, people that take advantage. One translation uses the word swindlers. You ever, you ever dealt business with somebody in the church and you feel like they, they try to run a game on you and they're like, they got, they still got a swindling spirit in them. I've seen people like that. Like they, they, they over here talking about Jesus. And I mean, the only reason that I know it is because I've been out there before. What I'm talking about is it was in the eighties, but I don't forget what it was like out there in the world is what I'm trying to say. And so somebody is trying to swindle you. You, you can, you, you remember what that spirit's like, but sometimes people, even though they're in the church, they're still operating that way. Y'all understand what I'm getting at right there? He says, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God, but this is the beauty of the passage. He says, and such were some of you past tense, such were some of you, but you are washed. You are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. That's really what I wanted to talk to you about tonight is I wanted to talk to you about what has taken place whenever Jesus died on the cross. And when you put your faith in that, that you literally became a new creation in Christ Jesus. That's what the word of God says. Second Corinthians five and 17, that those that are in Christ Jesus, behold, old things have passed away and all things have become new. Now, what I want, what I want to share with you first is uh, I wanted to share with you two words. OK, because I want to talk to you a little bit about righteousness and then I want to talk to you a little bit about the word justified. Now, this is only for illustrative purposes. And, and so I don't want you to get caught up in, in the fact that I'm going to write a Greek word up there because I'm not asking you to memorize the Greek word. I'm not asking you um, to, you know, be able to spell a Greek word. This is all for an illustration. OK, because I want you to see how closely related these two words actually are, all right? And so here's these two words. Now listen, I was a Christian for 12 years. 12 years in a spirit-filled church and never even really remember anybody preaching on justification by faith. Christian, that's a problem. We need to understand the word of God and we need the men of God to preach the word of God. You can't live right if you don't understand justification by faith and you can't live right if you don't understand what true righteousness is. Listen to me, for 12 years, my, you know what my Christianity was like? It was like a 12-step program. I felt like I was one step away from losing everything almost every day of my life because I never truly felt free. I'm here to tell you that I've been in three rehabs by the time I was 19. I don't keep mean to keep on talking about that. But the first thing they told me was you got to say your name and say you're an alcoholic or a drug addict. And they didn't want me to say that for the rest of my life. That is a lie from the pit of hell. The word of God is contrary to that. The word of God says I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. The word of God says that the old has died and been buried and that the new has resurrected 
to newness of life. But listen, if you don't understand that, how that works in the word of God, how are you going to be able to believe what you're supposed to believe in order to receive what you need to receive? What do you need to receive? The power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit flows through the finished work of what Jesus did at the cross. Hallelujah. There is no other way that he's going to move in your life. And that's not just, listen, if some people in this place are watching on video. You might be, yeah, but I'm powerful in the gifts. You ain't got one gift. And first of all, it's the Holy Spirit's gift, number one. Number two, you ain't operating in no gift if Jesus don't go to the cross. You understand that? And the Holy Spirit ain't moving in you or through you unless Jesus went through the cross. Amen. And, and it's the same thing with everything that we see in the new covenant of what Jesus has come to give us. All right. So I want to talk to you a little bit about these two words. So here is uh, righteousness is this word right here. Actually, it's like this. So this word here, you would pronounce it. This is supposed to be a K. Dikaiosene, okay? Dikaiosene. And this is the word justification. You're going to see what I'm talking about here in a second, all right? And this word here is dikaio. Now, you see how the root right here is so similar to one another. You see that? So it's just like a suffix that's different. Oh, this, this word here, dika. Dika. What is the reason that I even did such a thing? Because I want you to understand the closeness of these two words. I want you to understand how closely related the word righteousness is to the word justification. Okay? In Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 11, the scripture uh, says this. In Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 11, the scripture says, And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel has justified herself more than treacherous Judah. I'm not going to get into the theology of what all that means right now. I'm just trying to make a point to you. In the Hebrew word, the way that that is descriptive of the Hebrew people is the idea that it was almost like a court setting. You understand that that God, that, that when a judge renders a verdict, then a judge is going to render a verdict that you're either guilty or you're not guilty, right? But in a court of law, in the world that we live in, the verdict of a judge out there is not the same thing as the verdict of the judge that we serve. Does that make sense? Yeah. And what I'm trying to say is this, okay? And I promise you, don't be offended if you're paying child support because I did not think about anybody whenever I came, whenever the Lord gave me this illustration. So it doesn't have to do with anybody in here. I'm trying to use it as an example, okay? Whenever a person is paying child support, they, they're either paying it or they're not, right? And so they've been mandated, an injunction has been placed on them that a certain amount of child support needs to be paid. And so they're, let's just say that they're being faithful and they're paying their child support. And then the spouse, whoever it is, man, woman, whatever, because sometimes women make more money than men, the spouse brings them to court and they end up in the court of law and, and, and the, the case is brought before them and the judge is like, he's justified. He's he or she has been paying their child support. But see, the God we serve, see, and that's good out there. That you're justified. You've been doing what you were legally responsible to do. You're paying your child support. But God brings it to a whole other level. And if he's going to deal with our hearts, he's wanting to know, okay, why you had to pay child support to begin with. You understand what I'm saying? Because what I'm trying to get you to know is, is that legality is not the same thing as morality. And that God is dealing with our hearts and he's dealing with the moral issues of our heart. Amen. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants to get to. He wants to get and he wants to get in there and he wants to fine tune it. Because, listen, we're responsible not just to do the right thing to, to the lady or to the, you know, the man, vice versa, whatever that we had a child with. But 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 God's wanting to deal with our hearts Amen. and he's wanting to show us the things that are going on on the end side of us. Amen. And so I wanted you to see how close these two words were. So the verdict of justification, the word justification means a, that you've been declared innocent, right? And so the word righteousness has to do with your standing. And so I want to share with you one scripture. You can turn to it. This is the King James uh, Romans chapter three, verse 21, because I want to talk to you a little bit about righteousness. 
just just for a second, I, you know, we can't really, we, we can't exhaust it right at this moment. But let's see here. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. All right. Okay. L well, let's look at, let's go up to verse 20. It says, therefore, the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So the law reveals sin to us and it shows us right from wrong. But, but in the time frame of the law, you ha we had no help from the Holy Spirit. Humanity had no help from the Holy Spirit in order to live right or to do right. He was just told what he wasn't supposed to do or what he was supposed to do. <clears throat> now look at this. In verse 21, it says this. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So I'm going to go ahead. I mean, we're going to try to keep it careful that we don't engage the whole crowd too much. But I want to open up the opportunity to say, what do you think that that verse means right there when it says now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested? First of all, what does the word manifested mean? Revealed. It means it's revealed. It's here. Amen. It's Jesus. Thank you. Well, how do you get Jesus out of there when his name's not even in there? Well, what does it say? The righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So let's just go ahead and break this down for a second. The righteousness of God was revealed through the law of God. You understand that? God revealed to humanity through his people Israel. Listen, this is all part of the big plan of God. God called Abraham, and y'all heard me say this so many times. God called Abraham. He said, come out of your father's house. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you. And in thee, in you, in your loins, Abraham, on the inside of who you are, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. And that through that one man, Abraham, through many, many years, God produced a nation called Israel and he gave them the law he gave Israel the law to be his representatives if you want to go home and read something like go read Deuteronomy chapter 4 chapter 6 and chapter 8 and what it keeps repeatedly talking about is the statutes and the judgments of God then God tells his people Israel he says this he says listen you you need to teach this to your children you need to, he said you need to put it on your finger you need to make frontlets on your head. You need to put it on the doorposts of your house. And he said, and you need to teach it to your children. He said, because look, I'm about to bring you into a land. These people don't know me. That, the purpose of Israel is the same purpose for Christian. The, the word, just as, just as Israel had a tabernacle that the Spirit of God dwelled in, in the Ark of the Covenant beyond the veil, and was mobile and traveling around in the wilderness, so say is you, with the Spirit of God on the inside of you, you're like a mobile temple, a mobile tabernacle, hallelujah, carrying the Spirit of God with you everywhere that you go. And people need to see the truth truth of God in you flowing out of you. But if we take a brother to court and we're doing all these other things, then in reality, we're not looking and we're not supposed to be that because such were some of you. Such was some of me. Amen. We're not supposed to, we're not supposed to live that way. So look, so that's the first part. The righteousness of God was revealed through the law of God. But now the righteousness of God without the law has been manifest. You see what I'm saying? And I'm, I'm trying to tell you what Paul's talking about right here. He's talking about Jesus. You got to take my word for it. Go home and you can double check me. But as, as a matter of fact, let's just read down a little bit further and then we'll go back to it. Look at this. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them who believe. Do you know that whenever you get saved, praise God, when you exhibit faith in God's plan, then God lays the righteousness of the righteous one on top of you. You do realize that if you, it, you're going to make it into heaven. Amen. You're born again tonight. You got Jesus living in your heart. So you're making it into heaven. You do realize, though, you're not making it in on your own righteousness. Praise God. You're making it in on the through the righteousness of Jesus. And that when you put your faith in that, a great exchange took place. Jesus took your guilt... And he gave you his righteousness. And therefore, because of the righteousness of Jesus, you will now be able to enter in. 
But listen, this isn't just for salvation. Yes, this man. is for sanctification. This is for living right for God. Because you're now righteous in the eyes of God. And because you put faith in Jesus and what he did for you at the cross. Now the Holy Spirit is moving in your life. The Holy Spirit, if you'll yield to it. Amen. But if you want to add to your Jesus, you're going to frustrate the grace of God. Yeah. Listen to me. You want to add to it. And listen, this goes on in churches all over the place. Where we add to it a 12-step program. Come on, help me out, somebody. Listen, listen, this is the truth. It's not Jesus and psychology. It's not Jesus and the counselor. It's not Jesus and the 12-step program. It's not Jesus and the law. It's not Jesus and fasting. It's not Jesus and I read 10 chapters today. It's not Jesus and I went to church today. Do you fast? The Word of God says you should fast. Hallelujah. Do you pray? The Word of God says we should be some praying people. Amen. Uh, do you go to church? Forsake not the gathering of the brethren. So don't hear what I'm not saying. What I'm trying to say is that if you try to earn even a sliver of righteousness through and, and above and beyond what Jesus has already done, then now you're trying to add to the finished work of what Jesus said. And when he said it is finished, he meant it is finished. The work is complete. Amen. And you and I can put our hope and trust in that. Now what we need is, we need our mind to line up with the truth of the scripture. We need our mind to line up with what's already on the inside of our spirit. If we are indeed born again tonight. That's right. If we have truly been converted, that means that the Holy Spirit has moved in to the inside of our spirit man. But now we got to know what to believe. And so, so a righteousness, going back to verse 21. So the righteousness of God without the law, which is Jesus, has been manifested. Look at this. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Well, what do you think that means? Okay. Well, here we go. What is the law? You could say it's the Ten Commandments, right? But you could also say it's the first five books of the Bible. The Pentateuch, right? Well, in Genesis, in the garden narrative, God slayed an animal. And he covered... Adam and Eve with the sinlessness, the sinless, the, the, that animal didn't sin against God. You understand? Blood had to be shed. And, and God used the skins of that animal to cover Adam being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The, the whole sacrificial system in the book of Leviticus being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The whole tabernacle and temple. Whenever you walk, the first thing you walk up to when you're getting ready to enter into the tabernacle or the temple later on. But when you enter into the tabernacle, the first thing you got to do, what is the bronze altar? That, that's where the sacrifice was laid open. That's where the innocent animal was burned at 9 o'clock in the morning and 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You're not moving any further into the presence of God till you do business at the cross. In order to enter into the presence of God, you got to go through the sacrifice of Jesus, the sinless one. And then you go through the whole bronze labor, which represents the washing of the water of the word, I believe, which is Jesus, because Jesus is the word of God. Amen. Then you enter in and off to the off to the left, you got the uh, you got the menorah or the, the candlestick, right? That's burning. Then the priest has to go in there and trim the wicks every day and replace the oil. He's the light of the world. Now you're the light of the world because he transferred his light into you. Yeah. Amen. And then, and then in the very front right there, you got the altar of incense. He ever lived to make intercession for you. And then off to the right over there, you have the table of showbread. One of the ways that it's translated sometimes, it's like face bread, kind of like face time. The bread is to be before him always, before his face. And then you're able to have communion, the priest work, once a week on the Sabbath. Okay, God wants you to know he sent bread from heaven so that we could have communion with him. And then when he died on the cross, the veil that separated was split. And then you walk in and there's the Ark of the Covenant with the cherubim and the presence of God right there. And once a year, blood had to be sprinkled on top in order for the priest to even be able to go in. Yeah. It's the blood of Jesus. It's the plan of God. The law and the prophets. David was a prophet, Psalm 22. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Zechariah was a prophet. In those days, 
The, the, uh, God will pour on the spirit of grace and supplication upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem and then they will look upon me whom they pierced and they will mourn for me as one who mourns for an only son. Isaiah said that he, he was wounded for our transgression. He, he, he took our iniquities upon him and like a sheep led to the slaughter, he did not even open his mouth. Now the righteousness of God is manifest without the law, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. In other words, I want you to know that God's been, he didn't do this in a back alley somewhere. That's what Peter said. We're not telling you to, to cunningly devise fables. This didn't happen on the back of some dark alley somewhere. No, no, no. God's been doing this. God's been telling us from the beginning of time that he was sending him. And the word of God is also telling us that he's coming back. And I'm telling you, church, we got to get our hearts right. We got to get our lives right. Amen. We got to get close and, 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 and engage in the intimacy that Jesus has already purchased yeah. for you and I to be able to walk in. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So that's righteousness. The righteousness has a name. His name is Jesus. And when you go God's way and you receive the righteousness of the Father, hallelujah, the God, God, the Father, the judge, you know what he does? He brings a declaration. He says, justify. Justify. That's my legal declaration over your life. Ricky, Miss Angela, Gerald, you need to understand. Robert, Gally, you, we need to understand. Pamela, listen, God's legal verdict over your life, over my life, is that you're not guilty. Amen. Why? Because of the work of Jesus. Yes, because the blood has been applied. Because you accepted the plan of God by faith. And when you put your faith in that, God allowed you to be covered Amen. with Amen. the righteousness of Jesus. Amen. See, oh, hallelujah. That's good. The, the Lord's good. Amen. His word is true. Let God be true and every man a liar. It it's, not, it's not a whole bunch of other stuff with Jesus. It's Jesus. Amen. He's the plan. Yes. God bankrupted heaven of its most prized possession. It's all about Jesus. Amen. Let us exalt the king. Let us not exalt gifts. Let us not exalt healing. Let us not exalt deliverance. Yes. Let us exalt Jesus. Yes. The eternal Lamb of God. And I believe that it will exalt him. Hallelujah. We'll see him move in a way like never before. Listen, the church needs to get ready because I know God wants to move. Amen. And when I say the church, I'm talking about the big church. I'm talking about the big thing we call the church. We need to be praying for all them other people out there too. We need to pray for ourselves, but we need to have a mind and a heart for all believers. Praise God. It can't be us four and no more. Amen. Amen. It's got to be all believers because the Lord loves them. He loves us. Praise God. All right. You get the point. All right. Later on, he goes on to say this in verse, ver, for, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He says, you know, all things are lawful for me. We're not going to get into all that, but he does talk about, the, but the body is not for fornication. He says, meats for the belly, belly for meats, but those are going to be destroyed. So the belly, the stomach, I think you say a stomach or something like that in Spanish, the, 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 that's for the digestion of food. Okay, but but in one day, and I, and I mean, I don't know exactly what it's trying to say right there, because even in our glorified body, Jesus was eating bro fish. Right. Amen. But but it's going to be a new stomach. Amen. And both of those things will be destroyed because we're going to get a new stomach. Amen. But look what it says. But the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord. Look at that. I want you to see that right there. It says the body is not for fornication. And you said, but I'm not fornicate. Well, hallelujah. Praise God, because such were some of you. Amen? You're not that anymore, okay? So let's just, just, we won't focus on that. But look, so the body is not for that, but for the Lord. And the Lord That's right. for the body. Amen. And so what I need you to understand, and what the Lord's trying to help me to understand, is that this body that you've been given doesn't belong to you. That's right. It belongs to the Lord. He goes on to say this, right? So you can't just do anything that you want with your body. You can't just go to places, any old place you want. Listen, I've told this story so many times. I hope you don't get tired of hearing it, but I'm just going to tell you that night after my sister had taken her life and I ended up in that ballroom, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. 
I was so convicted after the Lord set me free. I hadn't been in a ballroom in 12 years. I'd been living for God, trying to live for God for 12 years. And I ended up in that ballroom. And when the Holy Spirit could, spoke to me, and the next day I repented, and it was like the weight of sin had fallen off on me, of me, and my eyes are open. And I, I'm telling you right now, you can think what you want, but you're free. You're not condemned. I understand that. But I wept in the presence of God for at least a week. Because of the fact that I brought the Holy Spirit up in that stinky place. <laughs> but, but it wasn't just weeping like that. It was like gratefulness. It was thankfulness that when I least deserved him, he showed up. And it was the goodness of God that led me to repentance. It was his love. But at the same time, I was stricken in my heart for where I, what I had been doing. And that's what the true conviction of the Holy Spirit is going to do. It's going to bring conviction to your heart. Amen. He says, um, look at verse 18. He says, flee fornication. Every sin. Look at the last part. Of it. No, go to 19. I'm sorry. This is what I want you to say. What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, That's right. which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. Look at verse 20. You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Dude, there's a whole lot to this. I just want to encourage people that might be single in the house tonight, you know, whenever you're looking for your mate, if that's what you're doing, you know, because a lot of times single people are looking for that. Listen, you got to handle your business. If you are a new creation in Christ, you got to handle your business. Like, you got to understand, before you ever a husband and a wife, you're supposed to be brother and sister. Yes. And, and I remember that, that old lady told me that at the clinic one time. I, was, I said, girl, I said, ma'am, I didn't say girl, I said, ma'am, I said, this world is in such a mess. I was a mess in the 80s, but I don't even know what is going on. She said, well, let me tell you something, son. It's because they didn't know that before, and we were talking about people in the church. They said, because they didn't know that before they became man and woman, they were supposed to be brother and sister in the Lord. And I don't know about you, but I ain't trying to kiss my sister. <laughs> but, but, but what I'm trying to get at is this. Is that, oh yeah, don't let me get on kissing because then I'll just, I'll lose all of y'all. But y'all go ahead, y'all y'all think y'all gonna get away with it. Oh Lord, let me stop. All right, the point that I'm trying to make is this. You have to, you have to be submitted to the Lord. You have to submit your heart and your mind to the Lord. You have to be led by the Spirit and, and not the, the Holy Spirit, amen? And, and you can't be led by the wrong kind of spirit. Because the enemy will come in and he will sideline you. Man. He will hijack yes. you. He will yes. buffet yes. you. He will put you off the path. Yes. And the next thing you know, instead of talking about Jesus, I was talking to one of my brother earlier today. And, and he's like, do you think that the Lord likes our conversation? Because, I mean, we haven't been talking about Jesus for the last 35 minutes. I'm like, I know that I love the fact that Jesus is the topic of my conversation. But before you know it, if you get into a relationship too quick and she ain't your brother or your sister first, you're going to be talking about that person 24-7. And that's, you're going to be giving that person glory. And, and, and listen to me. It's not that it can't be done. I don't even know why somebody needs to hear this. It's not that it can't be done. But we have to understand what it means to be in Christ. We have to understand that what our, who our members, our body parts belong to. And we have to be mindful of this. Man, you do not want to lose your walk with God over something like that. Lord, help us. Amen. All right. So verse 17 and 18 said this. I'm just going to read it to you. But he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit, right? Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. Amen. Righteous God, righteous people to reveal to an unrighteous world. And that was part of the message that I was telling you in Deuteronomy. I think it was in chapter 8. He said, I want you, I think in 6, he said, I want you to put it on your finger, my word. I want you to put it on your, your doorpost. And I want you to teach it to your children to the point where they're going to ask you one day, Daddy, why do we do this? And you know what he tells them? It's the same thing every time. God repeats himself over and over again throughout the scriptures because... Let me tell you, son, why we do this. Because we once were, were Pharaoh's slaves. And with his mighty hand, 
he delivered us out. Amen. And I don't know about you, but I have a feeling some of y'all in this place were Pharaoh's slaves. What are you talking about? Slaves to the world. Slaves to the enemy of the world. And he had you in bondage, praise God, but through the blood of the Passover lamb. Y'all know about the Passover, right? Through the sacrifice and the applying of the blood to the side post and the door post. Hallelujah. You were brought out of the bondage of the world, so don't be going back. Stay in the word of God that where it teaches you about the truth of Christ and what he's done for you at the cross. Amen. Amen. But in verse 8, he said this. If you carry it in chapter 8 of Deuteronomy, he said, he said, when I bring you to the land that I'm bringing you to, he said, when I bring you to the land that I'm bringing you to, he said, you need to have that word so close to your heart because you know what it is? God's word reveals the character of God and God's word is Jesus. And if Jesus is, Jesus is in us, but if we don't know his word, then we don't really know how to act. We don't know how to walk with him. Amen. And, and as that word is in our heart, he said, when I bring you to those other nations, they're going to they're going to say, what other nation, what other people is there that has their God this close to them? What other people is there that has such laws and statutes, which is basically the word of God so close to them? What other people is there that has their God? this close to them. And so you and I are the same thing. As we yield to the Holy Spirit, as we yield to the Word of God, then we allow Jesus to come out of us. Amen. I'm not going to keep you too much longer. We're, we'll actually close with two passages right here. Look at Jeremiah 31, verse 31 through 33. We're still in the Old Testament. I had a lot of New Testament scripture, but we're not going to be able to get through it. But it says right here in verse 31, we're talking about the new covenant, but we're seeing it revealed in the old covenant. We're seeing God promise the new covenant in the old covenant. Amen. And look what it says. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was a husband unto them, says the Lord. Boy, that's something, huh? I mean, I don't know that I ever saw that before just now when I was reading it. And I mean, I really need to go study it. But what I'm about to tell you is truth, one way or the other. And it says, that, look at this. He says, not according to the old covenant that they, that they, look at it. I took them by the hand. I took them by the hand. And then he says this, he says, though I was a husband to them, though I was a husband to them, then says the Lord, they broke my covenant, even though I was a husband to them. Whenever, whenever a man and a woman get married, they typically hold hands, right? That's right. They, they, they hold hands or there's some type of a, an exchange of intimacy like that during the ceremony. And the Lord's saying, I took them by the hand yeah. and I led them out. But yet they broke the covenant. I was a husband, but they weren't, they weren't faithful to me, is, is what he's saying. But in the new covenant, look what he says. He says, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. And I and will be their God and they shall be my people. Now, I want you to think about that. When you read the scripture, you need to be a thinker. Amen. It's important to think. What do you think, God? How in the world? Okay, so when, when Moses, when, when God, Moses went up on Mount Sinai and the Lord and, and God gave him the Ten Commandments, it, it, it was written by the, by the finger of God. Amen. So what do you think God is trying to say about this new covenant when he says he's going to write his law on their hearts in the new covenant? And I know some of you have been in this church so long, you can, you can, you've already finished my sentence in your mind. But I want you to go ahead. Somebody say, how did God put the law in your heart? How did you know? How did Matt Abair know the next day after he got saved when he was, he, was, he was a mess? Let's just use that word right there. He was a mess. How did he know the next day that he wasn't supposed to? To try to go pick up some girl in the ballroom in Morgan City. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise God. Uh, and whenever I call my sister up, I said, you know you ain't supposed to be coming in fornication. 
Fornicators on it, she said, you're in trouble, dude. And because she didn't want to hear about her life. She said, you're in trouble, dude. Okay, but so the that's exactly right. The Holy Spirit, the author of the law, the Holy Spirit that has the word of God now lives on the inside of you. Amen. And in your heart, you already know the will of God. Praise God. And if you and I will learn to yield to that. But look, we got to learn the sanctification part of the message of the cross because, look, our flesh needs to be crucified, my friend. Because our flesh gets in the way every day. Thank you. Our flesh gets in the way, and the enemy's trying to. <laughs> John said the other night in one of the Bible studies, he's going to come over there and tickle your little heart. That enemy's going to try to tickle your heart. He's going to try to wake you up to something that you already been. The Word of God says you're free. Amen? All right. This is the next one I want you to see, and we're going to close with this. Praise God. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 27. And I will put my spirit within you yes. and cause you to walk in my statutes, yes, yes. and you shall keep my judgments and do them. See, in the old covenant law, the old covenant law revealed to God's people his righteousness, and through them, he revealed his, he, the point was to reveal it to the world. You, you understand that? God, God's plan for Israel was the same as God's plan is for Christian, that he would put his presence with them and that he would bring them into the world, right into the new place where the world was that did not know him. And that if they lived for him, he would reveal himself to a lost and a dying world. And it's the same thing for you, Christian. Your purpose in life is not just to get saved and to warm up a chair in the church. Your purpose in life is to get saved. The Holy Spirit now indwells you. You learn the truth of the word of God. You walk in victory and freedom. Amen. And you release the presence of the Holy Spirit of God into the world that you live in. And people see what other people are there that have their God this close to them. Yes. Amen. Praise God. It says in the new covenant, put God's righteousness, Jesus, in God's people. That's what the new covenant does. And gives them power through the grace of the Holy Spirit to live a life of righteousness all the time. Now, I want to say that. And listen, if Jesus heals, then he also sets free. Okay, so we already, the power of sin is broken. I, I have scriptures in the New Testament. We'll probably just go ahead and cover some of those the next time. But I need you to know the power of, I can prove to you in the New Testament that Jesus already defeated the powers of hell. Yes, He's already defeated them at the cross. And it specifically says he did it at the cross. Yes. So it's already done. It's a finished work. Amen? Amen. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to break our will and crucify our flesh. In order for that to happen, we must joint participate with the Holy Spirit. Put this up there, Chris, and we'll close with this. Singers, musicians, you can come up here. We're going to worship the Lord. We'll have some opportunity for altar time. Amen. If you need prayer, praise God. Come up here. We'll be led by the Spirit to pray with you if you're going through something. But I want you to put up there 2 Corinthians 13, 14. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. Look what it says. Are you in the King James? Yeah. It says the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. In, in other translations, in the ESV translation, it says, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Sometimes this Greek word koinonia is translated as fellowship. Sometimes it's translated as communion. But right here in this scripture, this is what, look what it says. It says, the definition of the word koinonia, one of the main points to the definition, this is important, you need, to, you need to get this in your heart, is joint participation. That means the Holy Spirit does his part, but we also do our part. What is our part? Through the help of the Holy Spirit, we yield to him. We yield when he begins to put it on our heart, whatever it is he's speaking to us, we yield to him. And we and by the grace of God, we don't need to wait around and wait too long. Amen. Mm -hmm. Praise God, Father.